Folks, welcome inside the Paris Sea Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, company on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live, and download our free app to your smartphone so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. Can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And as I enter year number nine behind the broadcasting microphone, what an honor it is to bring in somebody who stood by the side of her her man uh, for so many years, uh, helped him through uh, a numerous amount of projects and creativity. Um, truly, um, uh, this individual who I'm about to interview uh, was pivotal in her husband's ability to continue to gravitate and navigate through the racket or the business in Hollywood, in film and television, um, and also just creating opportunities and livelihoods for a lot of his bandmates and a lot of his peers who were struggling just to sing for their supper. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, what it comes down to for my guest is that she smiles a lot um, and she understands that she has been blessed with so much and um, doesn't necessarily look at what she doesn't have, but rather what she has had and continues to have. Flip Man, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Oh, thank you. Can I ask you, um, when you um, <clears throat> when you first met Shelly Mann, um, um, when the music that, that he was playing, was he already... Um, playing with black musicians oh yeah sure um in fact there are a couple of uh older black musicians who uh, were responsible for teaching him a lot of things about the music and um just uh getting him you know get it getting his head straight about what's important. Well, let's, I mean, can we talk about who were they and, and what, in their mind, was important? Well, my problem here is that, I, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm 98 years old, and my memory for names <laughs> and dates... Right. No, th and then, you know, don't worry about that. I'm just thinking that if, 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 you, if he had mentors, I think that was my question, were they... The, the black African American mentors for Shelly Mann. And if, uh, I mean, we led in with this um, pretty seismic, I mean, this is amazing. December 23rd, 1943, in New York. And uh, we heard uh, that was the Coleman Hawkins uh, Quartet. It was Coleman, Eddie Haywood on piano, Oscar Pettiford on bass, and Shelly Mann on drums. But in 1943, were you already connected with Shelley? Uh, yes. Wow. You know, uh, he was in the service uh, because the uh, World War II had started, and um, he was in the uh, Coast Guard, and I was working at Radio City Music Hall and I, when I met Shelley. What were you? What was your job there? I was a rocket. Uh, you were unbelievable. For several years, yeah. Now, I mean, can you talk about the environment uh, on you know that Fifty Second Street in New York City? It was um, quite an interesting vibe there. Um, the art was flourishing at the time. I, obviously. Um, the great coming you're coming out of the Great Depression, but can you just talk about the 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 vibe of New York at that time when you were uh, performing as a rockette? Um, well, we were uh, in the middle of the whole thing. We had an apartment on Fifty Second Street, and of course, all the clubs were on Fifty Second Street, and um, we were really close friends with several of the black musicians. Ben Webster was a very helpful and um, much loved 
part of our life. Oh, my God. What a legendary cat, man. I mean, Ben Webster. So how did it work? I mean, you would fit, Shelley was in the Coast Guard, but was he stationed in New York, or where was he stationed? Yes, he was stationed in New York. Well, how ideal was that? So he'd yeah. go to his... Yeah. So he, he would... <laughs> He would he would kind of be on the what would be that I mean you'd finish your gig and and he'd be what what can you talk a little the best you can I don't need dates or names but like after a night of performance where would you where would you guys what kind of clubs was he playing at it you know in at, or or what was the yeah what was the night like uh, for you guys I mean because that really when they shut down Fifty Second Street they re I mean I know it wasn't a perfect place but man the it was a vibrant artistic scene down there and i'd love you to paint that picture for my generation well um all the top clubs were were there the right kind of in one place and uh shelly would go sit in and play usually with somebody until uh, i was through at night and then he would come by and pick me up or i would walk over to the club and uh, he would pick me up and uh, we were very involved uh, in everything that was going on. Um, I don't know. It's so different now. Yeah. It really is. Everything is so much more expensive. I don't know how working musicians can even afford to go in and listen to other working musicians. It's a totally different price frame. Is there a way to, I mean, just on your own opinion, um, I mean, the cost of living was much lower, um, was much cheaper. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, um, Shelley was, as a working musician, you guys were able to get by and maybe even get ahead at that time? Yes. Um, he got, of course, very little from the Coast Guard, uh, but um, I made enough to pay our rent from Radio City Music Hall. And uh, it was, uh, it was certainly, we had no idea uh, that it was such a significant time. Nobody would ever recognize it when they're living through it, right? You just don't, no. you don't, it's so cool to hear that because, yeah, I mean, today it's just, everything is so gentrified and, and you know, it, it I, it's it's pretty rough. I I mean that being said, I like I said I I was commissioned to do a documentary on Stan Getz that is still in a holding pa still in a holding pattern. Um can you talk a little bit about um this like going to Birdland? Uh this is to me like where the rubber meets the road. I, I mean Shelley was the greatest thing about Stan and Shelley. I mean these guys were just cooking up grooves all the time with their black brothers. I mean, it was really a beautiful tribe. And I, just from your own point of view, like, I, um, I mean, it seemed to me that the message of jazz at that time was, was truly about humanity and bringing all people together. And, uh, you know, I mean, did, did you go to Birdland a lot? Did you get to hang with, 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 with Bird at all? I mean, did you get to hang with these cats? Uh, well, yes, but um, some and not all the time is the answer to that. Some and not all the time. Listen to that. What does yeah. that mean? I, I love that. Well, um, I don't know if you know the, the, the uh, book that Jack Brand wrote about Shelley. No. Because there's some wonderful information there about the early days of jazz in New York. <clears throat> and uh, it's just, I mean, I, I, my memory of it is, uh, of course, framed by 
my life before that. I came in from um, a little town in Massachusetts, and the whole thing was new to me. Um, everything about everything. Um, and I, um, I have to really think to think about if somebody asked me a question to how, how it really was for us. And I don't think Howard um, was a universal experience. Well, you were coming from a very square, conservative town in Massachusetts, going to a, yeah. bi a going to a big city uh, where it was. Now, here's the question. So, the, but here's my okay, because I, you know, when I go see music today, especially improvisational music, um, instrumental improvisational music, I am all about letting the body dance. I want to dance, um, and I'm curious. Like, would was was when you first got hip to Shelley, um, and he was playing these clubs, was it sit down music or was it dance music? I mean, the big band stuff obviously was bit, was was ballroom dancing music, but I'm just talking about like club music. Like, did you find? I know you're probably exhausted after the Rockettes gigs, but did you find yourself going? Like, was the music about dance music? Like, we've learned today one reason that jazz if you even know what that word means anymore i mean it's like uh, we've been taught to sit and stare at somebody's facility and how good they are and as, as opposed to letting the body dance and be liberated and jazz was the ultimate democratic form of expression and i just wonder i mean it was one of those things where you would come in and i mean was was jazz a dance music uh, no no they they sat and listened. <laughs> they sat and listened. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. So, I mean, you, I mean, in, in, in a few words for people that will listen to this interview in um, long after we're gone, um, in your mind, what were the things that stood out that Ben Webster and other cats, what did they teach Shelley about how to be a good leader? Hmm. Um, well, I think they taught him a lot of other things before he learned to be any kind of a leader. <laughs> well, like what? Like what? Uh, like what? Well, um, they really taught him jazz right from the beginning when he was first learning to play. And uh, he, he, um, who were seminal in, uh, um, in, in, creating the whole jazz scene. So, um, I don't know, uh, I don't think I can tell you in words, because of course I was never a musician. No, but I'm not either. I think what I'm trying to get at yeah. is, um, you know, whether it's Emil Richards, rest in peace, or Gary Barone, rest in peace, or John Gross, or Jim Keltner, or, I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and these guys, I mean, they idolized Shelley. They idolized him, and not only that, they worked with him in places like going out to Calif into Hollywood. Again, this is more of a, of a <coughs> sort of an advocacy thing, but, you know, like, you know, people that played um, not the drum set, right? Not like the drum, tr the trap set, but the the hand drums or the chimes or the gongs or the tablas. Uh, Emil worked with Shelley and Irv Kotler and all these guys out there 
to get the union to give some of those cats double scale if they were playing multiple percussive instruments on albums. I mean, yeah. Shelley was a spearheader about it. He, he, I mean, I guess what did jazz stand for in our culture at that time? Did it stand for freedom or did, did it stand for people? I don't want to say this because I, I just, I mean, was it just like, I mean, was it res- was it a respected art? What what did it stand for in our culture? I mean, just the be- just from your point of view, coming from a place like you said that was, I don't know, kind of a non culture, coming into this bastion in New York City. I mean, what in your mind did it really st- was it respected by society or was it an enclave unto itself? Well, it was respected at that time, and uh... how do you know? Well, my opinion. Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. So. What? Well, I mean, it's your opinion, but based. What is your? Why do you make that opinion? Why? Why do you think it was? Was it because the people were paid? Was it? Be, I mean, what? What were the reasons why it was in your mind respected? Yes, because they were hired, after all, and uh, <clears throat> the. It was sort of an odd relationship because, of course, many of the people who owned and ran the clubs <clears throat> were, uh, um, they had run other businesses and not always um, something that was pure and uh, admired by everybody. Right, right. Uh, so, um I don't. I don't want to besmirch anybody's reputation, but uh, there were, of course, there's always been uh, a, an edge of lawlessness connected with clubs, New York or any place else. I love Flip. Keep going. You're cooking now. You're starting to cook. Oh. I lo- that, that, I know exactly what you're talking. You're talking about mafia clubs. People that were running yeah. illegal drugs or, or alcohol, right? They were doing that on the that yeah. was, right. And, yeah. and, I mean, John Hendricks, the great singer, told me without the Sicilians, there'd be no jazz in America. <laughs> He's probably right. <laughs> <yeah. laughs> well, I mean, so I mean, okay, so you knew, so so like, how did you, how did the, I guess there was an edge of lawless. I love that line, the edge of lawlessness. Um, by people that were owning these clubs, but then it was offset by this idea that people could come in and wash away the dust of everyday life by seeing this music. Um, were you were you somebody who was conflicted by the by the fact that your husband or boyfriend at the time was was working in these clubs, or were you cool with that? I, I was cool with that, and of course, when I had uh, before I went into the music hall because I was a very dumb uh, little local girl. They, at that time, most of the clubs also had a line of girls and a, a show, and I worked in those clubs, too, uh, before. So I'm sure someone has written a very good book about the clubs and the background of, of them all at that time. If they haven't, they should. Well, let me ask you. When you say that, are you talking about uh, um, burlesque houses? No, that's different. Yeah, I know. So, what are you what are you what are you referring to? To the clubs, the uh, the regular clubs that, uh, and of course, because jazz was the um, kind of music people were playing then, they were all. Um, in there together. But I mean, the line of girls, you would, were, were they like, I mean, were you, were you dancing to jazz? Or what, what I mean, what? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, uh, it's interesting. So even though people would sit and watch the club, you were, there was a dance element to it. I mean, were the guys or gals that were playing playing to your to the way your feet move to the way you danced yeah 
Yeah, it was pretty much popular music. What, what kind of tunes would you call out for them to play? <clears throat> no, I, I didn't uh, have anything to do with that. I mean, the, uh, the routines were set up by uh, a booker, and um, we worked for certain people that just ran all, all the lines and handled the costumes and things like that. Talking to Flip Man here on the Jake Feinberg Show, and she's doing the best she can to go back, and we're talking, my gosh, uh, 80 years ago, uh, it's not, <laughs> I mean, this is really, and, and she is still on fire at 98. I don't even know, God, I mean, it's just so impressive to, to hear you articulate this stuff. Um, how did you meet Shelly? Um, there was a going away party for a very good friend of his who was being inducted. Everybody was being inducted except the... Uh, the mobsters, they managed to escape all of that. But, uh, so my roommate and I went to the going away party and Shelly came with another girl. So he took her home and came back. And uh, Wow, he had his eye on you. <laughs> so we started uh, dating at that point. Well, I, mean, I what, knew what, his brother, his, Shelley's brother. What was his brother's the name? Roxy Theater, Stanley. Now, what did he do? I'm, so, so, I'm not even, this is so new. Is Stanley Mann? Yeah. Now, he, what did he, he do? Worked the, he was working in the costume department of the Roxy Theater. The Roxy was a, a block away from the music hall. It was also a, like a 500,000 seat house. Uh, very, very big going concern, and uh, uh, their father had been a, a very big in the um, production business. He worked at the Roxy Theater, and um, let's see. But wait, wait, wait. so, so you knew his brother first. Yeah. And then um, one night you just happened to. Be, I just want to be clear. There was an induction ceremony for what was what was what were they inducting? I don't I don't understand. No, it was a party. It was a party because he was being inducted into the service because uh, people were being drafted. You know, everybody. Oh was, wow! So they were going. They were going to go off to war. They were going to go off yeah. to war, and there was this going away party kind of thing. Yes. And that was when you met, and then that night at that party, Shelly showed up with another girl, but then took her home, and then you guys started hanging out. Yeah. Right. What year was that? Oh, here we go with the Beverly thing again. Um, I can't remember the year. Oh, it's fine. Um... I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, you made these um, references to um, some of the older guard really mentoring Shelley about about the origins of this music. and But um, did Shelley ever, I mean, there was a period of time, well, I mean, it's just her heroin was incredibly... Uh, popular amongst the jazz community for so long and I wonder if anybody got to Shelly and said hey man you don't want to deal with this did Shelly have any substance abuse problems and did did some of the no no he never even drank he never even uh, drank you know Shelly was a, an athlete <clears throat> he was a New York City cross country champion when he was in high school Runner, oh. runner, right? Yeah. Oh my yeah. God! So he continued. He was, but I mean, he must have seen his friends become. Ro he must have. Did he? Did can you remember people that friends of yours that just? Oh yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? How, how, like seeing people just, just destroy themselves? Yeah. So, I think um, 
the people who were the really no, notorious abusers, I think, are unfortunately pretty well known. And uh, it's amazing any of them lived at all. Well, who are the ones that you? I mean, they may be well known to you, but not to necessarily to the, to my to my daughters or younger generation. I mean, who? Oh, well, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, Stan yeah. Getz was a noted junkie. I mean, there were a lot of junkies yeah. out there. Yeah, there were. Was that one reason? Yeah. Was that one reason that you guys wanted to get out of New York? I mean, is that one reason you wanted to leave? No. Well. Um, and we got to California, and like everybody else, we decided that I was where we wanted to live. So, and it was still affordable at the time. When you first got out there, where where did you first buy your, what was your first house? Uh, we bought a um, quarter acre of land and uh, took a loan on the car. <laughs> And built a little one-bedroom house, and that was the beginning of the whole thing. What what, what town was it in? Northridge. Wow. So you wait, Shelley built a house by himself, or did he? I mean, how? No, did... no, no, no. We had it built. Okay, yeah. you had a house built. You bought a quarter acre. Right. You bought a bit, a little plot of land. Now, um, how did I want you to talk? A little, did you? Shelley started to uh, work. Do you remember meeting? Can you talk about Norman Grands at all? Oh, yeah. Norman was a very interesting man. Why don't you talk about him? Uh, <clears throat> well, he um, he was generous and he promoted a lot of the jazz musicians. Gave him a, a chance, and, but he, he was. Uh, he was definitely his own person and um, had, I mean, he, he could be difficult, but he, he got, he, he, it was his idea that the musicians should dress up um, for the concerts. He felt jazz should be given more dignity and uh, he he really he did a lot of promoting and got a lot of things done that I don't think anybody else could have done. Um, when he, the jazz, the Philharmonic again, that was people like J.J. Johnson and Stan and so many amazing players. I mean, did you travel like did, at a certain point? When did you stop being a rockette? When did you just begin to travel with Shelley, or did you actually just stay back in New York when they would go? Because they were going over to Europe all the time. Yeah. Um, I went to Europe a couple of times, but <clears throat> we were living in uh, California by then. By then you were living in Cali. Yeah. So. I'm just curious um, about, like, like I mean, uh, you know, you go out there and there is this intoxicating amount of people Monty Budwig, Leroy Vinegar, Richie Kamuka, Bill Holman, Herb Geller, Stu Williamson, Conti Condoli, Charlie Mariano. I mean, like, what, like, what was Flip? What was Flip Man doing? Like, I mean, were you close with their wives? I mean, was it a collective community? When I mean, how did Shelley break into the LA music scene? Well. Actually, I think he was one of the first to make that seed. And uh, yes, I was friends with most of the wives. Who, and, who's who's what? Can you talk about? I mean, I think this is like really important because it's. It, I mean, it's almost amazing when you think back when he started Shelley Mann and his men, and they were working. And those, all those iconic records came out. Lester Koenig put out all those records. I mean, those guys were playing for seven days at a time. I mean, like, it was like a family. I, and then you'd have P, East Coast acts coming in. Now in, in music today, especially in jazz, 
you might have 26 dates, but they'll be in 24 different cities. You're all yeah, over the place, yeah. right? You're bouncing. There's no time to really stick and develop a following and develop a, a fan base. I mean, can you take us a little bit through, like, you know, your what your role was and what the wives' roles were in, in, in cultivating this? I mean, West Coast bop, West Coast music was happening, but it was still kind of... I mean, it was just still kind of off the grid. I guess Hollywood was cooking with with Sinatra and those cats. But, what, I mean, what were your roles, and who did, who were you close with? Uh, well, again, I have um, memory problems with names after this many years. Uh, but um, we always entertained whoever was in town, you know, um, I, I used to do a lot of cooking in those days. Oh, wow. Oh, and, wow. Uh, um, because we'd been on the road. We knew what it was like. So we always tried to have, I remember one band had come to the house to dinner, and one of the guys laid back and put his head back, and he said, Ben, this house is like Christmas all the time. <laughs> Yeah, the road. The road was t- so. What were you cooking up? I mean, were you cooking a town? What were you co- kind of food? Were you cooking? Um. Yeah, I cooked a lot of Italian because that's one of the things we preferred, and uh, it was it was a fun time. I'm I'm glad it happened. Um. No, I mean, I, I'm curious though because when you like, can you talk about who? I mean, were cats like Miles or 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 Ben Webster or you know or like who would come from the East Coast that you guys would um, entertain when they came? Well, those guys, and I actually have a book that I had written everyone's that name in, so that I would you know um, when cook the same thing twice if somebody didn't like it. And uh, so I have a, a, a book and it says, I know the one group that were coming to the house, I always ask people what they preferred. And um, I tried to cook that to please that man. <laughs> and everybody wanted something different. So I cooked like five different things. Are you kidding me? Like someone, you'd go out of the store and get fish if somebody wanted fish? Or... Yeah, right. Shell, I mean, Flip, this is insane. And then when they got there, of course, every one of them ate everything. <laughs> they were starving <laughs> to death. They, they were yeah. starving to death. So uh, I should have call that book out yeah well no we, we, this is only set one yeah. i mean this is only set one flip we're going to do a few more interviews but i mean the the reality is that um do you remember miles coming to the house miles davis no i don't i think his band came and well who specifically who do you like chet baker was he living out there was shelly close with chet at all i mean who who were who mm-hmm. were no, because Chet, of course, was one of the... He was a junkie. ...addicts, and uh, um, we Ch- just yeah. said who weren't addicts, which I don't think comes through enough, but... Uh, you know, I mean, I've talked to, like, um, you know, my favorite period of Shelley's group, and I know that I can feel his spirit, my favorite period of time with Shelley was the early 70s. Uh, he had this band of really unsung, scrappy guys like Gary Barone and John Gross and uh-huh. Mike Wofford. And, you know, Barone and Gross were really, uh, I think they were drinking a lot. I mean, Shelley used to really give them, bust their chops a lot, give them a hard time. Yeah. But was he opposed to even, did, did he not, would he not even tolerate people that he knew? 
I mean, Shelly himself never drank. But, like, if somebody from a band like Alan Zoot Sims came in or I don't I don't know, anybody who came in and, and Shelly knew that they were – I mean, would he let them in the house if he knew that they had problems or, or – Oh, like, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. We lived with those people, you know, it's part of the seed. So you – I mean, why do you feel – in your own opinion, that that was such a prevalent uh, habit for jazz musicians, uh, heroin and, and and various other kinds of drugs. In your mind, why was it something that was, uh, I don't know, just the more people I talked to, the more that it seemed like, uh, well, at a certain point, if you weren't on junk, uh, then you weren't necessarily trusted. I mean, that's not necessarily that. I don't know if that's accurate or not. But why was it so prevalent with these guys in your mind? If I knew why, <clears throat> I'd be able to help some of them. Mm -hmm. But um, they were they they did what they did. And, you know, everybody's a grown up at that point. Right. Um, but at Shelley's point, even if, but I mean, did Shelley have, did he try to intervene with really dear friends? Can you share a story about him trying to help someone? I mean, I, I, I feel like um, he's the type, he was the type of guy who would not want to see people, or he'd try to do his best to try to save somebody's life. He did. He, he always tried, but. Um, Is there anyone in particular you can talk you know, about? No. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, what, 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 what was his biggest? What was his biggest? Um, what was his biggest? Um, well, let's just take it here. I mean, what in your mind? What put Shelley on the map as a as a star? Was it Andre Previn? Was it working with Kenton? Um, it, you know, it just it seems you just don't walk into Hollywood and become the first string session drummer because just because you're Shelly man what was what can, give me a couple of definitive moments that, big 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 breaking points for for you guys in Shelly's career that put him on this path to be the the iconic drummer of Hollywood well that's it he delivered you know lots of uh, composers reached the point in a hurry of not writing a part for Shelley, but saying Shelley will do something here, or, you know, he'll do something there. And uh, I think people that were on record dates with him um, knew about that. So, well, I mean, he, like, he, yeah. he gave them what they wanted. I understand, though, no, totally. Uh, I guess more to the point. What do you remember being? I mean, was it the man with the golden arm? What were what were what was like a major? First of all, Shelley Mann was born June eleventh, nineteen twenty. I mean, that is unbelievable. Um, I, I mean, just looking back on it, uh, what what do you remember when you got out to California? What was the big break? What was the the gold record? That started, or what? What got him going as a real? You talk about him sort of making stuff up too, right? Like people. I mean, you know, like that he he could. Um, he did, yeah. You know, I'm, so he had this improvisational nature. I'm just looking here. Um. Oh my God, this is just. I mean, think about when you moved out to California. Um. Do you remember how he got connect? How he connected with Andre Previn? Well, of course. Um, hmm. At that time, Andre was married to Betsy Previn, and yeah. she was had been a band singer, and uh, we got very tight, and we were really good friends for a long time. So uh, I I really can't put my finger on any uh, specific thing. 
One guy that re just passed last weekend was Jack Sheldon. Can you talk about him? Yeah. Can you talk yeah. about Jack? Yeah. Jack was in Philly then for, for, for quite a while. He was? Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Okay, yeah, let's, yeah. I mean, let's, I mean, let's, I mean, let's, let's pay homage to Jack. What, because, I mean, that dude was a great singer. Most people don't even know that. Yeah, he was. And Shelly always uh, tried to use him as much as he could to try to get Jack to be a little serious from time to time. But, uh, um, he was a very talented man, and he was a nut. So um, I think lots of people like Jack a lot. Um, um, wait, what did you say there? He who wanted to be who wanted who to be more serious? Well, Shelley tried to get Jack to be serious about some things. And, uh, like what? Um. Well. On the, on the stand, you know, um, he was only um, silly about some things. And, uh, I don't know. Anybody that knows Jack knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, here let, let's let's put something in for for Flip Man and see if it. Gets her memory going a little bit. I'm going to put this in for put this piece of music in for you right now, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Okay. Okay. The atomic bomb may go on. Blow me high in the sky I'm sure that wouldn't change the way I love you I'm gonna love you till I die Chlorine gas may spread around and Burn my lungs to a crisp Oh, I'm sure that wouldn't change the way I love you I guess I'm fascinated by your list Love and tears go together Baby, I'll stick to you in hot weather The war may come Song. Or you could get run over by a car Or what's the use of worrying You can't change it no matter what you do That's how things are Your love So warm and alive If you had the mumps Baby, don't you know I love All your little bumps Tell me Tell me, 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 tell me Baby, say that you love me too <laughs> Oh, Jack Oh, Jack, Atomic Bomb 19, 1962 on Capitol Records Jack Sheldon, vocals and trumpet Joe Mondragon on bass Shelly Mann on drums and all these guitar players. One, of, a couple of them I wanted to ask you about. One guy that I've, I, I have a couple albums by him. And Shelley, uh, and it really uh, speaks to Shelley's 
um, love of rhythm, this guy Jack Marshall. Can you talk about Jack Marshall? Oh, Jack. Jack was a very creative man. Yes. And, uh, um, How did they meet? I mean, it was he, I mean, because he, there are albums of just him and Shelly. Yes. Yeah, that's right. It was a lot of odd instruments, little <laughs> sound makers. Or exactly. Something. That's what, you yeah. see, that's, I mean, I mean, Flip, I can't tell you in my own journeys when I go on the road and see live music, I, you know, I, I come from the kind of the Louis Armstrong uh, school where I don't, I can't describe jazz, but I know it when I hear it, you know? Yeah. And, right. you know, because you'll get so many different definitions of what jazz is, but it's like the rhythm. It's the rhythm of jazz that's intoxicating and, and, and allows yeah. me to dance. I mean, like, did did, did Shelly have a studio where, like, where him and Jack would just fiddle around with all these different sounds and percussive instruments. I mean, I know the studios did, but I mean, what did, what did the rhythm do for flip man? I mean, did you, do you feel it's, that's one of the reasons you're still so healthy and sharp at this age? Um, well, I think you have to keep moving. Like Satchel Paige said, what did he say? What did Satchel say? Something about, um, don't look back because something like somebody might be dating. <laughs> I think that was a, probably a misquote. Um, I'm going to look that up. So, I mean, but I mean, the rhythm, I mean, you were at the manhole. I mean, you were there all the time. It, like, that rhythm gets inside of you. It's healing. It's healing for you. It's healing. It, 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 you don't get sick when you hear rhythm. True. Right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Did did can you talk about in your life with Shelley the time that maybe you guys faced the most adversity? I mean, I, I don't think that he's somebody that ever considered walking away from music, but what was the hardest, mo biggest adversity you guys ever faced? Oh, dear me. <laughs> oh, actually, I think we were probably very fortunate. Of course, for me, the worst time would have been when Shelley died. Mm -hmm. I certainly didn't expect that. But. Can you talk about, um, I just have heard through, um, you know, he was a big horse rider, and I guess one day he was riding the horse, and the horse made a wide turn, and he hit the barn, and Shelley's leg got caught. Uh, and there was a lot of internal bleeding, and you looked at it that night and said, you know, we got to go to the hospital. He said, I'm fine, I'm fine, and then in the morning he was dead. I mean, is, is that is that accurate? No. Um, no, he, um, he had an accident with his leg, uh, and I, I got him in the car and drove him into our wonderful doctor, who was the bass player. What was his name? Ralph Skoll. And he treated all kinds of musicians free and uh, was a wonderful guy. Wow. So, uh, but that was two separate things. Shelley had just come back from the Monterey Jazz Festival. He played that every year. And uh, I uh, heard a sound in the middle of the night, and some another ex rockette had just finished telling me about her husband who had died of a heart attack, and I knew what it was instantly. And ran for the phone, but of course it was. I just want to be, I want to get the chronology here. He had, he injured himself on the bandstand. Is that the first, when you took him to Scrolls? No. He, uh, <clears throat> we were riding the horses. And, right. Uh, um, he took his horse out first and something spooked it. And he made a sudden move and uh, t twisted Shelley's leg in his uh 
did some broke something in his knee. Wow. So it was kind of a serious accident. So he had internal bleeding or something that in, inside his leg. Um. No, I drove him into this doctor, and the doctor, they had to operate on him and uh, fix his knee. And he uh, he got over it. And then he went to the Monterey Jazz Festival. Well, that was you know, not connected to the other thing. It was he was there up there at the Monterey Jazz Festival, and he came home, and that night uh, he had a heart attack. Right. The Satchel Page quote is, don't look back, something might be gaining on you. Uh-huh, yeah. That's it. Can you talk a little bit about um, the decision to, when, when Shelley came, like, can you talk about when he decided to open the manhole, why he did that? Well, there were no clubs. You know, you, this is a cyclical thing. Um, there are clubs, there are no clubs. There are clubs, there are no clubs. Right, right, And right. so <clears throat> he decided he was going to open one. So we did. There was a man named Rudy Underweiser who had been a friend of ours, and he had run a couple of clubs. Shelley got a hold of him and talked him into uh, opening this, the club. And actually, it was pretty famous. It was probably the best known jazz club in Hollywood. So uh, he ran it for a while until <clears throat> circumstances. The man who owned the building couldn't uh, redo some lease or something. So well, no, it was uh, the guy I believe who owned it was Wally Hyder, and he had a yeah. upstairs. It became untenable because he had a. I don't know. The music was just too loud. I know people that did were dishwashers there. They'd come out, um, uh, you know, during their breaks and 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 watch the cats play and. Uh, yeah. You know, and how often, I mean, did you find yourself, like, were you, would you consider your? what did you love about jazz music, Flip? What do you love about the music? You were married I, to a man who was fully ensconced for years. Most, m most musicians have very hard times c keeping their families together because of this jazz lifestyle, and you stuck with Shelley. Um, but, I mean... Obviously, you loved him, but what was it about the music that the not that you? It's not about remembering who, what somebody said or who was there, but it's it's how it made you feel. How how did how did the music make you feel? Well, I, for most of it, I I really enjoyed it and I loved what I was hearing. You know, it, sometimes it got into strange things that I didn't like as much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are the things that I love the most. But I know, yeah, yeah I know, he'd get yeah. into, he, you know, a lot of people would say, uh, the younger guys that, that, that Shelley had in his band uh, told me that, <clears throat> you know, older cats like Richie Kamuka or, you know, people like that would come up and say, why aren't you playing the real shit, Shelly? Why are you playing the, oh, with these younger cats? Like, why, why, what are you doing, and, you know? And Shelly's yeah. like, they, Shelly's like, they keep me young, man. They keep me, he was always yeah. on, the, he was always on the cutting edge, you know? What did you, before, before we wrap up set one here, Flip, and I want to tell you, you did a, a masterful job doing the best you can. Um, oh, what did you love about Shelley Mann, and what do you want people to remember about this man well after we've left this planet? Well, just the way he was. He was a great guy. He was instinctively always on the right side of things. I mean, he didn't have to think about most stuff without knowing what he stood for and uh and backing it up. He played so many 
um, benefits and uh, helped so many causes. Can you can you name a couple? Oh well, um, we were very anti-war, um, both of us, and uh, we were also um, pro-animal and uh, of women's rights. We were. We were very involved in the community and always have been. And it actually, what so, like animal rights, anti, you'd have anti-war concerts. Yes. At the manhole, would they? Was that or where, like or where would? Do you remember any? This is really fascinating stuff. I mean, the, the idea that there was a, uh, a movement, a social consciousness movement attached with the music is really important. I think it's lacking today, in so many political movements, is the music. Ah. Uh. Yeah. But, I mean, does anything stand out in particular, uh, like an anti-war uh, benefit or, um, you know, in your yeah, mind? They played tons of those. Um, very, very involved in all the anti-war things. And um, I don't know what else to say about it well i mean what when you when you go to bed at night and or you uh what do you what do you what do you what is the memory you hold on to most of shelly man oh well i I don't know that I can get into that. Uh, okay. Well, um, did you guys have children, by the way? No. Did you want to have a family? No. 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 We weren't. We weren't set up for that. <laughs> no, I get it. Nope. Do you remember anything about? I mean, when I asked you about Stan Getz, you said Stan called and wanted to play at Shelley's funeral yes uh, he offered to play uh, but um, it was already booked. I had, yeah yeah I had friends who had been taking care of that well flip I if you're up for it I, you know I'd love to do another part with you uh, down the road uh, it was really an honor to talk to you and and uh, I think we can do get even more done well uh, I hope so. It's not easy for me to talk. <laughs> did you? Did about you? Did, these oh no! I, is it not easy because it's it's painful, or is it not easy because it, it's just hard to remember? Both. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen. I I would like to find some way to get this a copy of this to you. Um, maybe a, do you have a CD player in your home or thing something like that? Yes. Yeah. So maybe um, I can call you later and get your address, and I can mail you a CD of this interview so you at least can have this for your records. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. All right, and uh, much love to you, Flip. Happy New Year, and um, we'll be in touch. And, and uh, By the way, Jim Keltner, do you, do, what's your, do you, do you, know, do you know Jim Keltner? Uh? Yeah, yes, I do. And uh, um, In fact, when I was trying to get back in touch, with him, I called Joel the barber, and because I figured Joel would know, and he said, "Oh yeah, Jim Keltner." No, the thing about Keltner is he told the story to me about. I'm sure he's talked to you about it, but he, I mean, he was just like a teenager or something, and just idolized Shelley. And he called one day and to find out what kind of symbols <laughs> Shelley used, and and uh, <laughs> and you were like, you answered the phone, you're like, oh, I think he's taking a nap. But, but you're like, I'll wake him up. And so you woke him up. There's Shelly talking to Keltner on the phone about this, his symbols. And Keltner was just a kid. Um, but it was touching. And, uh, you know, I I wish we had a lot more Shelly Mans out there. We sure need him today, Matt. I, um, his spirit, luckily, 
uh, is still with us, uh, evident of this interview, which just went for 62 minutes. So you take it easy. Oh, my. Yeah, Flip. <laughs> and I'll call you later for your address. And um, much love to you. And if you um, think about doing uh, – maybe get that book out of recipes and we can just go through that book of food that people loved. You know, that might be fun oh, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Flip. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay. Okay, bye. 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 Staying on the righteous path with Flip Man. We'll be back with Ed Sof right after this. Thank you.